Okay, go ahead, start. The Boondist Movement. <laughs> In salzigen Jam von die menschliche Tränen gewinnt sich ein schrecklicher Ton. Er kennt schon nicht tiefer, nicht finsterer werden. Im selben Tabutiger Strom. And Maoist Rebel News. Ben Yehoshua, the cleric of public relations of the Jewish Bundist diaspora movement, and we have the founder and so far only anchor man of the Maoist Rebel News, uh, Jason Unruh. So, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. I really want to know everything you can tell me about the DPRK because I'm going to admit that although I know a lot about the Middle East and quite a bit about Russia, I don't know anything about Korea at all. Well, the history of Korea is one that, uh, well, mostly what's what's relevant is the history going back to the division between the two countries. Coming out of the end of the Japanese occupation of the peninsula, essentially uh, U.S. forces or Western-backed forces divided the peninsula in half. And then since then, they have used uh, aggressive tactics to try to collapse the northern part of the country so that the south could absorb it. I don't, I don't, I think that the details could, uh, are, are complicated, but the overall situation itself is really not all that difficult to understand. I think it's pretty simple. I think the main problem really is understanding the misinformation that is given out by the, about the North. Here's one thing that I get confused about. Um, the, the 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 Kim family. I'm, what what do you call that family? The the uh, the succession of the uh, of the what is it? Duche? Uh, not Duche. Um, the what's the name for it? The you know the the succession of the leader families. Uh, I I'm really bad with Korean names like Kim Jong Un or Kim Jong Il. Kim Kim Jong Un. Yeah. Okay. Kim Jong Un. Um. He succeeded from like he's the successor of his father, who's the successor of his grandfather. Is that correct? Yes. How does that work? Because I was told that that's a cultural thing or that has something to do with some sort of Confucian. And I'm really only hearing by I like I said, that's why I'm talking to you. I, I'm, I, I don't know how that fits into Marxism, Leninism. And I was told repeatedly that it's a Marxist Leninist country, more, more or less. Well, I would say that, you know, there is obviously a Confucian element still there. I mean, it's not something that's going to go away overnight. I mean, there's still some very traditional values, which I'm sure that the DPRK are working on. But, you know, it, it, it they're still going to be there to some degree. You can't change a culture overnight. But I would, I would argue that... Uh, despite that, they are elected. They have all. They were all elected within the Workers' Party. Like when it came time to have someone secede Kim Jong Il, they did vote for Kim Jong Un to take his place. I mean, it's hard to imagine Kim Jong Il forcing his son to be in power when he's already passed away. So they are voted on by the party to take that position. Now you can criticize the vote and say maybe say that it, it wasn't a good one, and you can make an argument that way. But the point is that he was voted in that position by the party itself. Okay. Okay. Now I've uh, I once saw somebody post. I ended up blocking this person on Facebook actually for several reasons I won't get into, but. This person had what I was able to find out were authentic pictures of um, North Korea. The problem, however, is he was criticizing how the streets were clean. 
and I didn't think that 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 was one of the first things that got me really interested. Is like I don't see this as a bad thing, um, because I see a lot of garbage, you know, on the streets uh, out here in Arizona, especially if you go to certain places in Glendale and down uh, and around downtown Phoenix. There's garbage everywhere. People just leave their garbage everywhere. You know, I, don't, I don't, you're the last person I have to explain first world privilege to. I'm pretty sure. Um, these things are just wasted. And I, I saw this picture. I was like, why is that your problem? You know, he couldn't answer me. And that's not why I blocked him. Like I said, I won't mention why. But uh, that was one of the first, you know, that, you know, it's, it's that moment when you realize something's out of place. And, you know, the more I tried to research it, the more I ended up not understanding what I was looking at. But I, I, I came to one conclusion. We're being lied to about North Korea. We have to be. Because the more I looked into it, the more things didn't add up to what was said, you know, on basic media forums. And it wasn't it's not like looking into Cuba. I can you I can I can easily link people to stuff on Cuba so that they know that they're talking mad smack that isn't true. Same with Venezuela, because I'm a big fan of uh, the Bolivarian Revolution. I'm a big fan of John Marie. I've been able to shut people up really quickly when it comes to anything Bolivarian or anything John Marie. I, I showed people what Gaddafi's revolution looked like, uh, where he might have gone reactionary, and why it was still a good country e e even after he declared himself a monarch. I showed people how Hugo Chavez's uh, revolution was successful, how people for the first time ever had education. I, I showed all this stuff. I I've showed people stuff on the USSR. You know, North Korea, though, it's very – it's almost impossible unless you know exactly – which I don't. If you, unless you know exactly what you're looking for, you can't – explain anything to anybody and and not to mention i don't know anything and why why is there such a shroud or like like why is it so much easier for me to access all these other countries i mentioned the information of what it is but when it comes to north korea it's like a it, am i just looking in the wrong places no i don't think you're looking in the wrong places i think it has largely to do with the former policy that the dprk had they were very isolated they didn't want to talk to the outside they didn't show what was going inside going on inside of the country now, that way, people in the West, those particularly ideologically motivated, could make all kinds of lies because there wasn't anything to refute that. And you notice that there's there's more of an ability to do that now than there used to be because of the opening up. I think is when people don't know anything, they're likely to believe anything about it because there's no evidence or anything that says to the contrary but once the dprk started opening up we started saying no this isn't true it's actually not what you're claiming it to be but i think the main problem is that the dprk is scary when people look at them they see a very homogenous society they see a very rigid a uh, well-defined uh, regimented society and they see a very militaristic society and that looks scary to people whereas with Cuba you don't have that at all Cuba is, seems uh, very laid back you know uh, a, a very a very chill they don't they're not they don't come off as scary they come off as people that are just trying to mind their own business and live whereas that particular image of North Korea is a very staunch anti-imperial, uh, anti uh, very militaristic approach where Cuba doesn't have that big military approach. So it, there's, a, a, there's a very big difference between the two in how they're perceived by the public. So uh, Venezuela have more or less falls somewhere in between the two. Uh, they are very heavily anti-imperialistic, but they don't have the, the very heavy militarized society the way that the, the DPRK does. So I think that's largely due to the the DPRK's policy of San Gan, which means military first. Their belief is that there is no that it does like what point is having a society if you're completely unable to defend it? Like it doesn't matter what you accomplish. If it can be knocked down by imperialism, then what does it matter? So everything to the fore, everything first into the defense of the country from imperialism. And that kind of militaristic stance appears uh, very scary to people who have lived in countries where the thought of somebody invading them is completely ridiculous. Like the thought of somebody invading the United States is just 
it's just it's just a nonsense thing. Like tomorrow, there, there's not going to be an invasion by another country into the U.S. There's not going to be an invasion on Russia or anything like that. They live without that fear. They they're not afraid that there's going to be an invasion by an imperialist power because they're so powerful. But this is a threat that the DPRK does have to face and has been facing for decades. So they have to put more effort into the prevention of such an event. So that kind of high militarization can seem scary to outsiders. There's also been some confusion that I admit that I have had the same confusion. And it's not because I don't look for the information. It's because I often don't know where to look. Um, so you have the Eastern Bloc. I was born in the Eastern Bloc. I'm... Like Vladimir Putin, I'm a proud socialist. I, I, like, I'm sorry, like Vladimir Putin, I'm a proud post-Soviet. I think the difference would be he's a capitalist and I'm a socialist. But I appreciate his position to not reject Soviet culture. Um, however, you know, he's a capitalist, I'm a socialist, but we're both post-Soviets. I'm, like I said, from the Eastern Bloc. So I know a lot about that. And so when I, I would explain people, you know, the Ukraine and stuff like that and all these, you know, you know, the Soviet Warsaw Pact and how that worked and everything like that. But when you mention North Korea, even I, and this I don't know if this is true, so if I'm wrong, I want to be corrected immediately. Was North Korea a client state of China? I really don't think so at all. Uh, very much the the DPRK was was very independent of both the USSR and China. For example, one of the reasons I believe that they actually came up with the Juche idea was so that they could av avoid the split that took place between Marxism-Leninism and uh, Marxism-Leninism-Maoism that occurred later on. This way they could say, well, we're not really taking a side, we're just doing our own thing, so we're not against anybody. You know, we're just doing our own thing and we'll have friendly relations with everybody. So I wouldn't see them as a client state of really anybody. They had been pretty fiercely independent of of that and they had uh, maintained good relations with both countries regardless of how the hostilities between uh the USSR and China actually took place. So I wouldn't call them a, a client state of either one. That's really interesting. So they actually therefore took heart to the Lenin-Stalin concept of socialism, one country you build yourself up before going international. Yes, uh, but yet they never went international, and, and I, I don't, I don't, fate, I don't, I don't fault that in any way on uh, anything Marxist-Leninist or Marxist-Leninist Maoist, because if, because a lot, I mean, there's a lot of ignorance about this. People don't seem to understand how harsh the imperial side was from America, Britain, France, and it's all the, you know, the imperial allies of how they. I mean, the Cold War was pretty dirty and nasty. And, and I would say on both sides there was mass corruption, but the real culprit is the West, you know, the, the capitalists. If you look at what they did and how fierce they were and how harsh they were, I mean, I'm not a big Khrushchev fan. I actually think Khrushchev was a piece of crap, honestly. But I, I understand why they let in free market policies after Stalin's uh, death. I think that that was a very destructive idea. I, I disagree with it full heartedly. To me, that's exactly where the USSR goes down. In fact, contrary to popular belief, the real persecution of Jewish people starts only after Stalin's death. You know, when you when you really look at what happened to the USSR, they I know why they did it though. They did it because they needed more production and stuff like that. It was not the right answer. I think that there was a different socialist answer they could have taken. But the thing that I've noticed is that there's no actual true free market policies of North Korea, which means that they would still be an actual full-fledged socialist country. Am I misconstruing that? No, I think, think that's, uh, that's, that's pretty accurate. So then we should be very terrified of them even communicating with South Korea, which is extremely capitalist. Not to say that Korean dramas aren't interesting to watch, um, you know, but this is – just look at what has happened to China. China is not socialist. The Communist Party – I don't know what to think about them. I don't know that much about China, but I know more about China. I, I see China as the one and only actual neo feudal country where they have a communist party, massively messed up capitalist corporations everywhere, and it's just extremely exploited from all ends. And you know, I'm not saying that everything is bad in China or that it's like hell to live in China, but you look at China, people are like, oh, it's it's that's that's communism. First of all, communism 
hasn't existed yet. You know, it, it's a theory among certain socialists. And it was a socialist country. I can't really say it's a socialist country anymore because they're not doing socialism. But I'm not sure if I would say it's a capitalist country. I'd say it's exploited by capitalists. It's a very bizarre country. And you, you see what happened with the, all that starts with the stupid market socialism, which led to the more free market policies, and then eventually you get capitalism. And there was, I would say, at least in the in the 90s and early 2000s, it, it would have been a capitalist country. Now it's just a mess. And I'm afraid the same thing will happen to North Korea, or it will just all, or South Korea will just take over the whole thing. I'm like the very idea of them cooperating scares me, because South Korea is in alignment with Japan, and Japan is a hardcore first world country, I would say, with extreme corporate capitalism. I mean, isn't I mean, do you share that 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 fear? Because that bothers me. Because any socialist country that maintains its independence and autonomy is is a miracle today. Right now, with the with the globalist version of imperialism that exists, where where, you, where I mean, corporations are without borders today, it's very terrifying. I think that people uh, may have the wrong idea about the way the relations are uh, ongoing between the North and the South. Uh, there's a writer, B. R. Myers, uh, who who is anti DPRK. Don't don't get me wrong. He is worried that the opening up between the North and the South, without the interference of the U. S., will lead to the North actually absorbing the South in the long run. And he actually makes a pretty compelling argument. Now that's uh, of course if everything goes the way he thinks it will. But, I mean, there's the having a peaceful relationship between the North and the South negates the U.S. from having any kind of pretext for having hostilities against the North. If the if the North and the South are, are peaceful in their cooperation, not necessarily, you know, uh, united as one but their hostilities are over, then what justification does the U.S. have for carrying out an imperialist occupation of the South? I mean, the South has will have every reason to just uh, kick the U.S. soldiers out. Well, we, we don't need you because there's no threat of war. So I believe it's a very smart political move on the part of the North to open up this kind of these kinds of warm relations with the South. So, so let me get this straight, though. This author you just mentioned, he's actually worried, though, that the socialists would take over without U.S. interference? Yes. He thinks that... Okay. In, okay. In, oh, yeah. Keep going. Keep going. I'll make my point after you speak. Keep going. Uh, I was just going to say, like, in the long run, if the U.S. pulls out, uh, given the uh, ideological solidarity of the North and the ideological loftiness of the South, that eventually, in the end the uh, the North will win out. I'd like to believe that his fears would be the truth, but I, I'm afraid of the exact opposite. And you make a correction here if, you know, because like, I, 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 maybe you know why I think that. Um. No, I definitely think the, uh, the other way could happen. Definitely. But I, I don't have all the information to go completely into his entire argument. But it, it could go either way. Okay, well, like, you know, with the tearing down of the Berlin Wall, which was, I think, a good thing because the wall shouldn't have existed anyway. But at the same time, you know, Germany's all capitalist now. But then again, that has more to do with the collapse of the Soviet uh, system. Um I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying very Western words. It wasn't even a collapse, really. Um, there was a coup in the USSR, <laughs> but Yeltsin and all that crap. Um, what I've noticed is socialism becomes popular because it works. Like I'm a real believer in socialism. I may be critical of the concept of communism after world socialist victory, but um, we, we've spoken about this in, in, in private. You know, it really shouldn't be the big question is, is whether it will be, as I would say, it, uh, 
world cooperation where contradictions are just non-hostile to each anymore, or whether it's communism, we need to fight for socialism. Well, with world socialist victory, for it to be done, socialism needs to be way more popular than it is now, and it is becoming more popular. But what I think happens, though, is in some socialist countries, because of certain strict rules for their own safety and even their own liberty they have because it's not the liberty that we experience that that we think we experience because we don't really experience it in the first world we actually are just overprivileged um you know i mean there's a there's you know i mean there's there's a there's almost a type of uh british american french israeli freaking japanese allure you know what i mean i'm talking about a first world allure of you want to have a great life and have the great vacations you want to be able to free to express yourself you need capitalism and i'm very afraid that that is what I think that that's the big weapon the capitalists have today is they have they have a really good um, they have it I wouldn't say they have a virtuous or moral or ethical image but they have a very alluring image where it, it feels like people get the impression that it's more comfortable I mean one of the reasons why I have issues a lot with anarchists is because not all anarchists are bad I think a lot of anarchists are very good people and actually would fight for the right causes. But I think that a lot of anarchists have a brainwashed Eurocentric mentality where they actually think I'd rather live under this capitalist system than let a Marxist take over because I'll have no freedom. Number one, who says that's true. And number two, um, what do you think was going on in the USSR? I mean, there are real criticisms to make about the USSR. There are real criticisms to make about um, Maoist China, but are you making the correct criticisms? Because a lot of the criticisms are just completely bunk. And I, I'm afraid that I'm afraid that sometimes this creeps like okay, for instance, East Germany. A lot of them were very unhappy with the system. And they cheered capitalism on. They only wanted socialism back when they saw how terrible capitalism was when it came. And I I, I shudder and maybe it's just over fear, but you know, it's just you know, with the way the acceleration of wars are and with the way draconian laws are being passed in the United States and in Canada and Britain, you know, I'm very I, – I, I like – I'm always happy when there's something that's not part of, you know what I mean, of, 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 the, of the imperial power structure. When there's something that's not part of the super globalist campaign, I'm always happy when there's a standout country that hasn't given in. And I, I, I've, I've begun over these last two years to see North Korea is part of that. They're part of what hasn't given in. And, and that's why I'm afraid. I mean, if you could comment on that. I'm, uh, I, I'm not entirely sure what the question is. <sighs> Do you think that the allure of capitalism would, would confuse North Koreans the way that it did East Germans? I don't think so, because uh, on one hand, there's a very st- – very social conservatism that's in the North that would make them very skeptical of anything necessarily in the South. Uh, Did you ever see the footage of the uh, K-pop group performing in the North? No, no. Uh, Like like I said, you you know, the most awesome footage I ever saw was it was something that Finnish Bolshevik did. I forget who he was talking. He talks to a lot of people. He talks to Hammer and Sickle. He talks to a lot of people, I would say, that deserve the notoriety that they've been given. And it was just this one thing. That was the closest I ever saw. That's one of the reasons why I like Finch Bullshit, because he does go out of his way to put that stuff up. That's the closest I ever saw to anything. And I, th- I think that, that that wasn't a turning point, but that's when I was like, yeah, I'm going to have to learn more because I, I do trust what I'm seeing because he, cause he would source stuff and he will source things. And... Um, I, I, but when I tried to research after that, I didn't find anything for the most part. I mean, I had found one thing that he referenced with much difficulty, and I had a proxy on because I was scared that people were paying attention to me because of something I had said a week prior. Okay, I think that the reason, like, for example, I, I would set so the example of the K-pop performance of the North Koreans were looking at them in quite a, like, what am I looking at kind of manner. Uh, they really didn't like the performance. They thought it was over-sexualized. They, they just found it, um, I hate to use the term degenerate because it has a very alt-right connotation to it, but that was the, the way that they were perceiving the whole performance. There's a lot in South Korean culture that they would 
that they would perceive as being uh, very undesirable that they really wouldn't want. So I think on that level, I think they're pretty solid. I get that. I was raised by the Jewish Ultra Orthodox, so I completely understand that. I don't know if you know this, but in the Jewish Ultra Orthodox communities, uh, you can't even shake a woman's hand unless you're related to her. So I, I understand that. Now I noticed a lot of Muslims are the same way, and I've known several Muslims that like the really observant Sunnis are often that way. Um, and you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, a lot of them will have healthier relationships due to such nature as that. Um, so I mean, what you're saying is is that they're they're um, they have a certain. Well, I mean, social conservatism is actually a decent way of putting it. Anyway, but what you're you're really saying is that they're very modest. They're not. They're not. Basically, they're not exploiting a sex culture or something, and they're not like flashy and. Yeah, there's there's less flash, more substance to the North Korean society. For example, they have a level of equality between men and women that doesn't exist here because they've eliminated many of those poisonous uh, influences such as over-sexualized advertising, pornography, etc. That makes perfect sense. You know, I don't know if you know about the recent statistics but like um there was a report that i picked up from an analyzer um he doesn't do it anymore but he used to put out really good reports and like a lot of surveys are very crappy but i mean he, he did really good surveys because of the way that he would go out and meet people and he would pick up information he would actually get people to talk about what they wouldn't talk about that in the united states four out of every five males is addicted to porn or at least has an on and off porn addiction not, not even wanting to, but they have that. Um, and I, I think out here in the West, there is a bigger need to look in the mirror. You know, it would be probably better if people weren't doing, you know, a lot of the stuff that we do. You know, South Korea is definitely very, well, I hate to put it this the way, they're very westernized. Oh, uh, yeah, very much so. I mean, uh, uh, K-pop is a perfect example of that. I mean, there's there's no meaning to the lyrics. It's completely bland nonsense reinforced by sexual imagery. And then you can get into a lot of the, the, the contracts that uh, the performers for K-pop have, which are frequently, and rightfully so, uh, referred to as slave contracts. I dig it. I, make, I mean, that makes sense. So the good news here... Uh, as we're both socialists, we're both going to consider this good news. I, I suppose the bourgeoisie wouldn't, but the good news is the DPRK is legitimately socialist. So that's that's really good to hear. But they're not just socialist. Uh, they've held on to their um, to their cultural autonomy as opposed to what the West has imposed on pretty much the whole damn world. Yes, uh, the DPRK has remained very culturally insular not to let uh, f foreign forces, which they uh, see as uh, very negative. I mean, that's not to say there aren't some positive aspects to Western society, but I mean, you wouldn't just be letting them in. You'd be letting in the other 90%. That's also pretty bad. So, uh, for example, uh, the DPRK will not take... Uh, English words and incorporate them into their language. For example, uh, a, a hamburger isn't referred to as a hamburger. It's called. Uh, it, it, I, I don't. I can't remember the uh, Google Bayan or so, something like that. I can't remember the actual Korean word, but essentially it means uh, double bun with meat. Uh, they don't use the term helicopter. They use thing uh, in Korean. It the the word means. Uh, straight up and down lifting off or something like that. Like they did deliberately exclude uh, Americanized or uh, Anglicized words in the language. That's, that's the degree that it goes to, to maintain their own uh, uh, cultural identity. You know, I, I think I appreciate that actually, because if I had my way, I wouldn't be speaking English. Like I am, I'm, uh, as I told you before, I'm Sephardi Jewish. Although I was raised largely by the Ashkenazim, I have a big love for Yiddish because we promote Yiddish as the universal Jewish language. But unlike the Zionists who try to get rid of all things that were not neo-fake Hebrew, um, 
because they you had to speak Hebrew. You, I mean, it, it was very terrifying for a lot of Jewish people that had nowhere to go. And the Zionists said, OK, well, you come here. And, you know, after they had blocked off them, they had to learn Hebrew. So Yiddish, they had a massive war on Yiddish. They did actually for a while have a war on uh, 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 Ladino or Judo Spanish. And then you have uh, Judo Arabic, which is almost non-existence, which is a real tragedy. With the Bundists, we do promote Yiddish as a uh, universal language for the Jewish people, but we do that because, number one, it's salvageable. Number two, it carries most of the Talmudic Aramaic, which is the real Jewish language, because Hebrew was only a liturgical language, which is why Neo-Hebrew is not perceived by any truly religious Jewish community as actually Hebrew, because it's not really Hebrew. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because if I had my way, I wouldn't be speaking Yiddish. I would want to speak Yiddish, but I would really want to speak Ladino because uh, and a lot of people don't know this for anybody listening. Judo Spanish, otherwise known as Ladino, actually started after we were expelled after Spain. We just like the Misra, I mean, we too were speaking Judo Spanish, sorry, Judo Arabic. We developed Judo Spanish afterwards, which proves just how much communication we had throughout the Muslim world when we were expelled. But if I could, I'd not speak English because I look at English as a very bizarre language. It's 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 an artificial language if you get into its history because it was trying to compete with the French language. And if you ever listen to old English, actually, if you watch the second Lord of the, Ring, Lord of the Rings movie, actually, um, you'll hear um, in a memorial, um, the woman is singing in old English. It's not recognizable. Like a lot of people will look at the King James uh, Christian Bible or they'll read Shakespeare and they'll think, oh, that's old English. That's not old English. That is early modern English, actually, because if you've ever have heard old English, it doesn't sound anything like English. And I find English has it's everywhere. English is all over the place. It's like the imperial assimilationist language and it creeps into everything. And it's not a very attractive language. I would even say German is more intellectual if you if you from what little I've been able to because I'm trying to take German, you listen to German. It's a lot more sophisticated. There's nothing sophisticated about English. It's just a bunch of useless words. And I'm not saying that it's bad to speak English, but like I, I can appreciate any group that has managed to keep English language out of their tongue, you know, because um, it's everywhere. I mean, you watch any Japanese animes? Um, there's some really good animes you can watch, but they'll 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 use a lot of English. I've noticed they'll be English out of nowhere. Um, I forget which anime it was, but they were making a reference to something. And instead of saying a Japanese word, they said "nice body." I swear, that's what I heard, and I was like, I looked at my wife, who was much bit more in anime, I was like, did he just say nice body? She says, yes, he said nice body. I was like, why? He's like, oh, well, they emulate the English language. I'm like, why? They got bombed. Hiroshima. Not even necessary, if you know about it. And I went on a whole rant how, how it was not necessary, and how actually Stalin was the real victor and everything, which was not necessarily the conversation. But the point being is you had Eng you have English words that creep into Japanese culture all the time. Yeah, I mean, very much, uh, you know, the occupation of the of Japan by the U.S., uh, the kind of cultural imperialism that eventually came in. I'm not surprised by that at all. Uh, the, the thing is that the, the English language tends to just take in everything and make it its own. So you end up with. Uh, frankly, in my opinion, the English language is just stupid. I know! <laughs> it, it, it's got like 10,000 grammar rules, but with 5,000 exceptions each. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I, it, 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 it's a very... I, I was talking to um, a Vietnamese immigrant. Uh, he ran a really... He actually ran a really nice shop that was closed down because freaking Walmart came up, you know, and everybody who... I think that that's funny. Everybody who wants to say they want free trade, I keep mentioning, if you want actual free trade, get rid of the market because uh, capitalism will destroy free trade. You want to keep free trade alive, be a socialist, if anything, because then you can do it in an organic sense without the problem. Anyway, his shop is no longer there. There's a Walmart. It's really sad. But he had a great shop. It had a food restaurant on one section, and it had supplies. You could get gardening tools and all kinds of stuff. But he had a hard time with English. He could speak it. But he told me English is very hard to learn. When I came here, it was so difficult to speak English because I thought that it was going to – and it's funny because I've heard this comparison now a thousand and one times. He says, I thought it was going to be like learning German because the grammar structure is similar. But it's nothing like German. There's a lot of rules that don't make sense. And I was like, really? He says, yeah, English is very difficult, very difficult for me to speak. 
Um, and I, I, I remember once uh, 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 seeing uh, a Jackie Chan interview on the Tonight Show when I was a younger kid, uh, and uh, he was struggling with the word. And, 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 and that very memory is what popped up when he said that. I was thinking, you know what? I, I would suspect, particularly for, for Asians, it, English would be difficult to learn um, if, if they're not familiar with it. Because I, I know that I know I know um, uh, there was this group of uh, people from some place in uh, not South Africa, the country, but the southern area of Africa, and they struggled with English uh, tremendously. And you know, with the way that the Asian, uh, not number one, pretty much uh, every Ang Asian language, from what I've noticed, is not as related as say. Uh, European languages tend to be a little bit related to each other, so you have to take that into context. The second thing you'd have to take into context is that if they're unfamiliar um, with um, European languages and they try to go through European languages, but then they try to do English, English is just an insane fire hoop to go through at, compared to other European languages. And yet it's the dominant language. Well, it's been dominant largely thanks to the English Empire. Yes, the sun never set on Britain. They say. I didn't know what that meant until I found out that what it meant is they had an area, they had, they had empire all over the planet, and that means that the sun never set on it. Um, now global imperialism is doing that, though. So, <clears throat> on the matter, back on the matter of the DPRK, what do you think? Uh, first of all, their biggest fear is. I mean, because we had, you know, Trump say he was going to blow him up. And, 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 and actually, I think that that's really what my question is. Why do you think Trump reached out the olive branch after saying, he, you know, we were going to go after Rocket Boy? And do you think Kim Jong-il buys into the stupidity of Trump? I, mean, I, I, I think that Trump basically wants I – th I think it's interesting. If there's an existing agreement with a country, he'll destroy it. If there isn't one, then he'll create one. It almost seems like he's just doing the opposite of what already exists. I, I've noticed that. It's why why does he continually pick a fight with people who they don't really have a fight with, but then try to make peace with people that they do have a fight with? It's almost like he's literally just doing the opposite of whatever the prevailing trend is. For example... Uh, Donald Trump, you know, uh, God bless him. He's not very sophisticated, as a way of putting it. Uh, Kim, he's doing all this as, as a propaganda effort with the North to say, oh, look, I was going to create the peace and all that. But, I mean, Kim Jong-un is not stupid. He, he's not going to give up nuclear weapons for essentially anything. Uh, although the... Statements that the North has made saying we would give up our weapons if we were to get so such and such, they know they're not going to get it. I mean, it's just it's just not going to happen. There's not going to be uh, a removal of a U.S. threat to the DPRK unless it collapses and becomes a colony of the U.S. So it, it's not going to happen. Uh, Kim Jong-un is uh, probably just stringing him along in order to get some kind of sanctions relief. That's probably the real reason. But, I mean, uh, let's face it, uh, the conflict between uh, the DPRK and the U.S. is not going to end until one of those two countries no longer exists. Well, let's hope it's the United States that will no longer exist. So I also heard, and I'm verifying this through you, that they're very green in North Korea, that eco-socialism is achieved over there, that they actually have better environment, that the pollution is almost non-existent. Well, I've never really heard that, that it's very uh, green. They tend to be the opposite for a lot of developing countries. They can't afford to make a lot of the uh, concessions for environmentalism that first world countries who have a lot more access to resources and capital will do. But the DPRK does have a lot of green energy put up out of necessity due to a lot of the blockades they have against them, and particularly when it uh, refers to oil. They do have a lot of sanctions on them to block them from being able to buy as much fuel as they actually need. So the resorting to using windmills and solar panels is just something that they have to do. You know, it's not like even a really a choice they have. I mean, it's a good choice to make, but it's also very reflective of the sanctions that are going on against the country, that they're reaching out to these 
alternative sources of energy, not so much that they ideologically believe in it, but out of an actual real material necessity. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay, well, no, thank you, because uh, I, I, I hear a lot of stuff, because I've, I've been talking to pro-North Korea people lately, but I often find them to be just as much an unreliable source as the people that bash it. And, 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 and thankfully, I think I know why, because you talk about the isolationism, which is for their own protection. I think that w w actually, would you say that DPRK defenders will make up stuff to defend it, too, on top of it, just because they're desperate to? I think that when there's a gap in in knowledge, people can it, it can tend to do that. If we do not know either way, then either side, there's a tendency to do so. What do you believe the solution is for um, people in the West that are for the truth? I mean, because like, it, it's not the same thing in the third world. Our biggest concern in the first world, I would say, is things like martial law, trying to evade fascism, making people conscious of what capitalism really is and why imperialism works the way that it does. What do you think our solution really is? Because I'm just, unfortunately, I'm in the position where I have to worry about my own group and make sure that that we get representation where we don't have it. Well, I, I think that uh, we're at a point where, you know, you, you've heard the expression, you can't beat the system. Mm -hmm. I believe that that is true, that you can't beat the system, but you can break it. I like you don't. You, obviously, if you get elected to office, you're not going to change anything. I mean, you're you're not. I mean, the idea of voting and changing from the inside. I mean, that idea has was discredited over a hundred years ago. So I think that creating turmoil, more social unrest, will either a lead to the reforms that people are going to want, or it's going to lead to. Uh, capitalism essentially tearing off its mask and just revealing itself to be what it is and that's fascism you're i mean it's obvious that you're not going to change the system by voting for somebody different that's not going to work you're, you're going to have to tear it down and you don't even necessarily have to do a civil war to accomplish that kind of task all you need to do is uh, mass social unrest and the system will respond the only way it can by more repression Okay, well, I have a, I have a particular question then. So, I have said, and this is not very popular to say for people who are for the hardcore facts, which I am too. I think everybody in the Bundist movement, particularly, has this position that we're much more for the hardcore facts. Sometimes speculation is unavoidable, though, because you have it's do or die situations. We need to come up with some notion of what the heck we think's going on. Then there's things that you don't have documented, but we know. For instance, when you said on the Bolivarian Revolution, we know that the that U.S. imperialism is behind this. Even countries that would try to deny it, they know. We know. Do we have proof exactly? Not exactly per se. We have what well, we have evidence, but we know. So there's some things we just know that we shouldn't be afraid of knowing. But I think it's funny that when Trump first got in, he said, "You're fake news," but all he does is propagate fake news. But his so-called opponents are also fake news. And you literally have to go to the social democratic media forums to get anything out, such as Press TV, uh, RT, The Real News, Democracy Now!, God bless Democracy Now!, they, they get very confused in my opinion, but they do put out good stuff. You know, even Al Jazeera, there's Telazar uh, TV, there's, um, there's that Turkish network, I forget what it's called. Um, TRT? I, I, yeah. I mean, a lot of it's pretty decent, but I would call that social democratic press. I wouldn't even say it's democratic socialist. If you want a democratic socialist, and I have said this before and I maintain that, pay attention to Chris Hedges, who I do not always agree with. But I think that his voices of dissent thing that he does is a good thing, but he's a democratic socialist. But that's an actual democratic socialist, not a social democrat. I think what we do have, if we want to find the real social democrats, we should stop paying attention to the progressives and pay more attention to the media the social democratic press is letting us talk to some extent. I mean, we have, I think it also depends on an effort 
on us put like what you've done you are now on press tv quite a bit which in forgive me for putting it this way in an info war sense that's a victory in that context at least um but we need to put up a socialist press more if anything like i think that mrn needs to be an actual news network where you are the manager that is actually a, a, i know that you've gotten a job offer but i think that you should actually make MRN press something that could actually outdo all the democratic, uh, sorry, all the social democratic press, because there's a point where they don't talk to us. For instance, there's a group that I that I that that they don't understand Marxism at all, in my opinion, because they're only looking at classical Marxism. They're known as the Machika movement, and we do endorse them because they are the true indigenous voice. They don't even know that they're the vanguard of the indigenous. They don't even know that. They don't realize that. They're not conscious of that. They just know that they're trying to educate people on what the indigenous Native Americans are and who they are. Um, one of the reasons why they're so turned off is because they can't get any coverage from Democracy Now! or any other social democratic press. I, I'm hoping eventually we can give them the right to speak on their own behalf but i think part of what needs to happen is like there needs to be a different conversation than what we've been having so for instance as i told you before i'm a socialist but i'm not a communist because to me communism is a theory that marxists and anarchists have and i'm not saying that it's not true if you can legitimize communism completely to me i could believe it, it it's valid but as i said before i'm more for once world socialist victory has been achieved, um, uh, cooperation through many groups like world cooperation, because I find communism to be a very assimilated uh, assimilationist concept. I'm not saying it has to be, and I have heard better arguments for, for uh, communism, ironically, always from some strand of the ML, which it should not be surprising because Stalin did save socialism, whether people see it that way or not. Um, do you think that, um, like, especially if we're talking about things like the, D, uh, the like, 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 like North Korea, do you think that you could actually expand um, MRN? Because I think that that's necessary because there are very few, like, I really like a lot of what the Marxist Leninists on YouTube do. I mean, the really productive ones. Um, I think, for instance, uh, Democratic Socialist 01 is pretty good. I don't always agree with him. I think he's a bit too pacifistic in nature at times. I really support fiendish Bolshevik. I mean, I would say he's exactly on par with you, although you guys differ. Like, I agree with him kind of on his context of world revolution, but I think that you have a more of a, I think where your strength is, is, is you keep harping on the first world versus the third world, and I think that that's been largely missing from the conversation, which is why I think MRN needs to be a full-fledged network. I mean, would you be interested in doing that? I would be interested in doing that, but where's the money for that going to come from? Well, I mean, I mean, if, if I could do it tomorrow, I'd do it. But the question is, when you're pushing an anti-corporate view, where are you going to get your funding from? Knowing that the corporate sector funds everything. I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, Telesaur, they're funded by actual governments. So they've got their money that way so they don't have to worry about corporate advertising. Uh, Press TV is funded by the, the Iranian state, and mostly what they push is an anti-imperialist stance, which is totally fine. That's that's fine. That's what Iran needs, is a relief from U.S. imperialism. But for a lot of these things, it's, it's where are you going to get the money from? And I mean, what company is going to turn to me and go, oh, that, that, that guy who makes 9-11 jokes, let's... Uh, Let's give that guy a couple hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> I love your 9-11 jokes. You know, this might surprise you. I was in Brooklyn when 9-11 happened. And um, I remember the 9-11 truth movement when it came out. And back in those days, I wasn't sure whether I was with 9-11 truth or not, but I didn't like the way they, they got censored. And you, you may not like this, but I actually did kind of like Alex Jones because back in the day he actually talked about real stuff. The problem I think with Alex Jones is he just went more and more insane. And he, I have always told people, if you think that this guy's a shill, you're an idiot. He's an opportunist because he doesn't have an official position. He goes with what's ever popular at that time. He, he cornered conspiracy theories as a market. And this gets into kind of a, a controversial stance I have. I don't know if 9-11 is an inside job, but I know one thing that makes it different from the JFK conspiracy theories 
If you look back at that time, the mainstream media covered both stances, the official story and the conspiracy theory. Today, there are four stances you can take on 9-11. There's the inside job theory. There's the foreknowledge theory. There's the official story, but then there's the media fiction. We don't even get told the official story. We push officially the official story. Now, we're divided on what we actually personally believe. Like me, I said, I've said before, I don't know. Dr. Weisfeld, for instance, he believes the official story. Donna Newman, she believes in foreknowledge theory. Uh, two of us uh, believe it is an inside job. I think the problem, though, is even if you believe it's an inside job, you'd have to go with the actual evidence that makes that argument because there's a lot of people that have infiltrated 9-11 truth over the years and made it look ridiculous, for anywhere from aliens to the Jews did it, uh, to the Freemasons did it, and going way off track. I think the official story is perfect because – what is on record? We know where Al Qaeda came from, man. We know where it came from. It came from the CIA working with this group known as the Mujahideen through the Carter and Reagan administrations. This is toxic to the empire if you say the official story, which this is one of the reasons why I completely divested from 9-11 truth altogether and wouldn't even associate with them. Is this like the official story? So it's just like, dude, that's not the official story. That's some narrative that they're using because the official story doesn't help the empire. It actually is more damaging than 9-11 truth as a whole, 10 times more damaging. Because if you get into the official story, we know exactly who Osama bin Laden really was. We know what the stance was that Ronald Reagan took on the Taliban. This is, the, it, the chickens came home to roost. I think the official story is is, is, is perfect because like, um, you may or may not like Noam Chomsky, but I have actually on this bookshelf somewhere here. Yeah, I have it right here. 9-11 by Noam Chomsky. This is a weapon against like I mean it's not I don't mean like weapon like a bomb or anything but it's it, this, this this is a an actual truth weapon against the establishment no conspiracy theory needed no truth seeking campaign just the facts that's not what they talk about on the news they say we they hate us for our freedoms I mean if you really listen to the corporatized mainstream narrative they're not pushing the official story they're pushing a bizarre narrative which they by the way change over the years they completely change it um, and they do it slowly, and there's no way they're not calculating this. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on this. I think so, definitely, in that regard. Well, we saw that with the Iraq War, too. It was about weapons of mass destruction. And then it, when it was very clear that there were no weapons of mass destruction, it became about toppling a dictator because freedom. So I think that's uh, definitely one. I am of the belief that... 9-11 uh, was carried out by, you know, terrorist forces, but I also do believe that we are not being told the entire truth about the story. As long as there are pages of the 9-11 Commission that are redacted, then we're not being told the entire truth. In most cases, I probably... I would be more I'd be inclined to believe that there was Saudi money going into it. And the United States particularly does not want the relationship between the two to degenerate because of that, because the Saudis control, you know, a large portion of the world's oil. So I think that's the case, and it might eventually link back to organize, um, intelligence agencies within the U.S. that it was a kind of thing that they knew was coming or they knew that was a possibility, but they didn't do anything about so I think there's probably some degree of culpability on the part of the U.S. And that's what they really don't want to cover up, although that's what they want to cover up. But I, I, I don't see it as being a, a huge, massive conspiracy. That's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure if I really even care if it was a conspiracy or not, because I, 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 I don't like the fictional narrative that they're pushing because it's not true. It's not true at all. Um, we know who the Mujahideen were. If you watch, for instance, Rambo 3, who does he join forces with? He joins forces with freaking Al-Qaeda. He goes with the Mujahideen, if you actually watch that movie. I'm, and and I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very captivated by the collective historical amnesia that the United States population seems to have uh, it, consistently. It, it's really bizarre to me. Like, I kept trying to point out there's no point voting for – okay, my favorite video from you. It's still my favorite video to this day. In fact, if you actually go to the uh, – uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll try to mention that part later, but I'm going to mention my favorite video that you ever did. You did the white privilege drink with the marshmallows. <laughs> Best video ever. 
I love that because I felt the same way. That's that's when I started realizing, you know what? I could literally be this guy's like long lost cousin or something because I have the same freaking rage about this. Uh, never mind the fact that I don't think it's worth backing Bernie Sanders. My stance with Bernie Sanders, and I'm finally going to come clean with this, um, is that I respect the man. Unfortunately, he's a centrist, left-leaning Zionist, which is unfortunate. They couldn't even let him. But but here's the thing: I wouldn't vote for him. But I did, I did support people who were being ostracized for supporting him. But I was the same way with that with Ron Paul, and I think Ron Paul's ideas are ridiculous. But what I liked about Ron Paul was his more anti-imperialist stance that he at least spoke of. Not not I don't know about practice, but spoke of. The thing that was embarrassing as hell: he won against Hillary, and they gave it to Hillary anyway. Yeah. He wasn't gonna. He wasn't gonna shut down the establishment. What the hell were they afraid of? What the hell were they afraid of? Hillary stole it. That I, I'm about to say bad words, so I got to be careful here because you know YouTube. You know you never know what they're gonna flag, but like he won against Hillary. They gave it to Hillary, and then she won the popular vote, and then they gave it to Trump. But of course we have the electoral college. What the hell? You, you know that you cannot hack the electoral college. You can't do that, man. You cannot hack the electoral college. There's nothing electronic about the electoral college. So Trump ex de facto one fair square according to the fact that this is not a democracy. It's a representative republic, which in my opinion is not a good thing because if it was a democratic republic, at least we could have localized direct democracy. But, but whatever. The point being is that video reached me more than anything in the end. That's not the one I, could, I told you which video actually won me over with you years ago. But the one my favorite was that where you drink the white privilege drink because you with the marshmallows because I don't know man I don't know because <laughs> I was like you know I was like I I I felt that because it's like man Hillary is the number one war hawk of all time if you were gonna look for some concession you can't go with Hillary you would have to go with Bernie Sanders and Trump really was spouting the most retarded racist. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I shouldn't say retarded because there's actual retarded people who are, I know two of them that are geniuses. So what I mean is moronic, yeah. Moronic statements made. Uh, you know, uh, build a wall. And he was saying literal Islamophobic crap. Before my, gr before my grandfather disappeared, my grandfather told me the stuff that they are saying about the Muslims is exactly what they said about us on the eve of World War on the eve of World War II. Identical, the stuff that they say, it's terrifying. And yet, these were the people that protected us from century, for centuries from the Western Church, when the Western Church was illiterate and nobody could read Latin, so they could get away with things like the Crusades and things like the Inquisition, because they literally didn't know. I'm sure you know that the Catholic Church, you know, it has its infighting, but it's a lot better today that they can read their catechism and they can read their Bible now because before they couldn't. So the papacy could say whatever the hell they wanted, and this caused massive genocide. But who protected us? It was Muslims. And so, you know, I remember my grandfather saying they're saying the exact same things. I can see America becoming Nazi Germany right now. And it always stuck with me because it was the last thing he ever said to me before uh, he took his trip, his plane trip, and we never saw him again after that. And that that still comes in my head over and over because because by the way I'm so I wanted to cover um, the uh, the the anchor woman from Press TV too I just haven't had the opportunity to and I was so happy that you're like one of the only people that covered it and because I've seen in broad daylight people rip off the hijabs off of women and they say I'm liberating you I've seen this out here I see this all the time the the mosque up on the Black Canyon Freeway has had actual terrorist attacks but it never gets covered it, you know and it's terrifying me. And you people are like, oh, we're so oppressed. Man, there are poor people with cell phones. Yeah, it's messed up to be poor, and they're definitely what I would say is lumpen proletariat. But our lumpen proletariat today has cell phones. There is no, as you said, there is no invasion coming to the United States of America. That's not going to happen. There are no Russians hacking anything. It's all U.S. imperialism w w with its – I wouldn't even say America controls Israel or Israel controls America. I'd say that culturally they're twins actually if anything. Um, the only um, – um, Israel interferes with elections in America if anything. APAC is a big, big problem here, and yet we're worried about freaking Russians. We're worried about Russians, and we're worried about Muslims. Muslims. You mean the people in their – the first religion to declare freedom of religion and necessity was Islam under the caliphate. And I'm not saying theocracy is the way forward, but I'm just saying that that was one of the best systems. They Like if you get into the Quran, other religions are expect they, – they 
they, they tell you defend the Christians, defend the Jews, protect the people of the book. The, the, the first people to promote – I mean other religions promoted it, but the first ones to make it mandatory in their own little Bible – was the Muslims, and that's who we're afraid of. We're afraid of the people that actually believe in freedom of religion, the Muslims. That's who we're afraid of. We're afraid of Russians. You're talking about people who literally believe in freedom. I've been to Russia, man. They believe in freedom, and they're the Statue of Liberty America thinks it was. And, you know, the USSR had amazing programs back when it was the USSR. Um, I mean, they, 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 the only European country I could say that was truly ass backwards was Russia. And in a short amount of time, they industrialized. And here in the United States, not only do we not know, we typically don't care out here. And I don't think that we all don't care, but I think that there's such a brainwashing machine that people just don't get it. Uh, you know, um, if you could comment on that. I mean, because this stuff actually terrifies me, the, the type of fascism that, that is rising out here. No, I definitely think that is something that is pretty much on the way. I think that as crisis strikes the United States harder and harder, they're going to have to come up with something to try to force a solidarity with uh, the people of the country. And I think that Islamophobia is, is a pretty good way of doing it. I think that uh, pointing out constant external enemies to blame for internal problems you know that's uh, that that's a very key. I mean, that's kind of really what Germany did. Germany went through a terrible period coming out of World War One. I. I mean, let's face it: a lot of the uh, rules that were placed on them were were pretty harsh. And Hitler pointed to real problems and blamed the Jews for it. So I think that that very much is here to a, a different degree. America's problems are you know their their own fault really. And they're just trying to blame someone else. Uh, you could, uh, you, you know, you blame the Muslims, blame the, blame the Jewish bankers and the, the central bank, or or blame the leftists. I mean, it's it's a, it's a really a huge blame game. Whereas, say in the past, you know, there's been one blame that that was uh, blaming the Jews or something. Now, in America, it seems like it's a blame everything. You know, whatever. Whatever you don't like, that's that's the cause, and that's good enough for us, kind of thing. Yeah, there's also a fake divide, but I mean, it's fake in the sense that it's fake because they're arguing over nothing. But it's real in the sense that they'll literally, at sometimes, even get into fistfights over it with this liberal versus conservative thing. Which I'll even go further. There are no conservatives and there are no liberals here. First of all, I would say the only liberalism that really exists in my mind is social liberalism, which is an academic concept, and the only real conservatism is cultural conservatism, which is what you see with the Amish, for instance. And so in the context of political conservative, at least in political liberalism, we don't even have that either, because if you want to see a political conservative, look at Vladimir Putin. If you want to see a classical liberal, this is going to sound weird, but to pay attention, for instance, to Jesse Ventura, that's a classical liberal. We don't have liberals or conservatives here anymore. So it's not only that liberal conservative was fake to begin with in the political context, not in the social or, or cultural context, because in that context, I'd say it's very real. Um, like I would say that I am very socially liberal. I'm not a liberal, you know what I mean? But I'm very socially liberal. Uh, um, but like if you get what I mean, I think you get what I mean. Yeah. Um, but I'm not a liberal. Neither in the political context or in the neoliberal context. But that's the thing. Neoliberals and neoconservatives are not liberal. They're not conservative. When when did a real political conservative ever believe in intervention? When does a real political liberal believe in shutting down debates? It's we I swear the United States actually is worse than it was before. It's actually it's like ten times worse. People are like, oh, it's so much better and everything like that. Uh, yeah, we voted a black guy. Yeah, you voted President Uncle Tom in office. I mean, I, I never heard, um, I never heard um, Mu'ibul Jamal, in, you know, endorse uh, Barack Obama. I never heard that. I never heard the actual representatives of the black nation in the United States represent say that Obama speaks for us. In fact, they saw Obama. I mean, and I know I've known several of them. Uh, I still know at least three of them. Uh, they, they hated Barack Obama. They saw him as President Uncle Tom, what, what Malcolm X referred to as the House Negro. In fact, they consistently brought up him as a House Negro in the white man house. <laughs> you know, and that's true. There, so, like, there will be little fist fights, whereas before they would actually uh, – liberals and conservatives would debate. 
they now will go into fistfights, but there's even less of a division between them. They're, 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 you know, they're, they're now fighting more aggressively with each other over the same nonsense when they're more sane than they were before. For instance, the golfing buddy of Bill Clinton really is Donald Trump. They still ca- they called before Donald Trump ran. When Donald Trump ran, they still called each other on the phone. And I remember seeing on um, I don't even know which channel it was. It was one of the corporatized mainstream media channels. They're like, this has been the most politically diametrically opposed uh, um, campaign. I was like, no, this puts Romney versus Obama to shame because even that was like nothing because we know that Romney had a lot to do with Obamacare for one thing. Um, But even that was somewhat of a divide. This was no divide. It was vote for Bill Clinton or vote for Bill Clinton because you have his friend. I would even go as far as to say they might have at one time been best friends or his wife. So basically, it didn't matter who you voted for. You were voting for Bill Clinton. You were voting for the same. They 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 were like go for Trump because uh, uh, go for Trump because Trump is against the Bush Clinton oligarchy. No, Trump will actually be the savior of the Bush Clinton oligarchy, and that's proven because Bill Clinton starts with the Oslo. Accords and Trump fulfills them because if you I don't know if you looked at the stupid Oslo Accords, but it literally was geared against Palestine. They were what they're allowed to have a paramilitary group, but they're not allowed to actually, you know, have real freaking army. And then it, it, um, we all in the Jewish Buddhist diaspora movement, hardcore, we believe um, with good reason that the Oslo Accords were done to slowly develop a land grab so that Palestine would cease to exist. And I think that that's been proven. Like people say, well, he's deviating from the deep state. No, he isn't. He's a different fraction within the deep state. And of course, we're seeing division where there wasn't before, because when you consolidate power in the capitalist structure, eventually it will cannibalize. We're seeing that cannibalization happen right now. But what do you think about the fake um, divide among liberals and conservatives, which is actually more brought down to a fist fight now than ever before? I Even though it's it... more fake than ever before. That's what's crazy. I think it's definitely a case of, you know, there's a controlled opposition kind of thing. You're allowed to criticize the system. You're allowed to criticize things within a a, a certain range. You know what I mean? Like you're allowed to make this faux conservative side and you're allowed to make this faux liberal side. In other words, you're allowed to either say that there's this corrupt politician that we shouldn't be having or there's this corrupt corporation that we need to control but nothing that essentially criticizes the system itself for example um monsanto one of the most you know terrible corporations that have ever that has ever existed in mankind uh that company is always seen as some kind of aberrant behavior oh they're just really crooked or or they're just terribly evil but not taking into account that literally what they do is the profit motive and it's the inevitable result of the profit motive and it's corruption of the environmental protection agency and the FDA is the inevitable result of a capitalist system who wields power in capitalism, but capitalists. So, I mean, you're allowed to, uh, denounce Monsanto for the things that they do, but you're not allowed to denounce Monsanto for the system that produces it. So it's kind of like a, a fake debate kind of thing. You know what I mean? Treating the symptoms without getting into the actual disease that causes the symptoms, basically. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is uh, something that, like, there's been some push from people to say, well, why don't we just, uh, you know, why don't we just, you know, try to take over the system with them for a minute? I've, I, I mentioned that's been done before and it always fails. And this other person had said to me, like, well, I agree with revolution, but it needs to be nonviolent revolution. I'm, and then I mentioned nonviolent revolution has way more casualties than violent revolution. If you look at the history of the USSR, very few people died in the revolution. Same thing with Gaddafi's revolution. Same thing with uh, Chavez's revolution. Tell me what do you think, though, um, is it, it, do you think this is highly coordinated? Because I'm going to mention something very – again, I, I can, and it's not because I think Marxists are afraid of it. I think – well, I think Marxists are afraid of talking this, this about this, and I don't blame them because there's been a lot of shills promoting falsehoods. But I think that there's a thing that harms us in that I have stated, for instance, that – there are conspiracy theories that have weight to them that we should look into, but the problem is, is most th- conspiracy theories are manufactured. I connect this to Cointel Pro. In our primary documentary, um, I mentioned that 
most most conspiracy theories are manufactured. We need to start COINTELPRO awareness because we have a higher likelihood to survive revolution if we're aware. So, for instance, the Black Panthers, if they had been more aware of what was going on or how highly coordinated the provocateur and the infiltration really was, they may have been able to push back. Of course, part of the fault lies on them, ironically, for going into electoral politics to the degree that they did. Like, I'm, I'm not so upset with local city elections to an extent but to an extent if the position is still to get rid of the country like the u.s the united states of america would have to cease to exist it would have to but um what do you think about manufactured conspiracy theories i mean can you see that i mean I, personally i think that's why they actually got rid of alex jones because he wasn't really with their program in fact to me he's the only one that wasn't he was just an opportunist who was really good at selling it and he was crazy Whereas all the other shills they've kept up for some reason, just not, you know, because I think Alex Jones at times did harm the system, but I think he destroyed himself because with that Sandy Hook thing, he really destroyed himself. But like, what do you think about the idea of manufactured conspiracy theories? Because. Yeah, I definitely think that there there is a, a degree to that. Uh, for example, we were talking about 9-11 with the four different theories, but uh all the ones that question it are painted a certain way with one broad brush, even though they are different things. For example, saying that I don't believe the official story because I believe that there is information that they are withholding is not the same thing as saying it was an inside job. But if you do say, I don't think we have the whole story because of information that's being withheld, you're treated like it's a conspiracy, like you're being a conspiracy theorist. So they are kind of pushing that, that false narrative in, in, in that way. Well, it's funny because I, I, I honestly don't know if it's an inside job, but I knew credible people who truly believed it was an inside job, and they had weight to what they said, but they were never listened to. They would listen to people who would pin it on things that couldn't possibly have anything to do with that. Uh, again, you know, um, I, I don't see how that doesn't smack of infiltration, but I get tired of talking about 9 11. The reason why I bring it up only is because one of the th processes, and, and I guess you're a good opportunity for, for this. One of the processes I want to do is I need to justify to people who do believe it's an inside job, who have a clear head about why they say that, why we are not going to promote that. Because it, it's it, it's not that we should just compromise if we if we truly have a stance on something, but that there's no way that the whole 9-11 truth, at the very least, at the, at, the, at the most was fake to begin with, at the very least – hasn't been completely taken over and the and the official story itself which is not purported by the media i i do find damaging and i find you get way more done by showing where al-qaeda came from who ronald reagan really was and how that all works you get so much of the wall breaks down you know the wall of lies breaks down once you do that you know um like the only conspiracy theory that I openly talk about to everybody that I maintain is that Danny Castellaro didn't murder, uh, didn't commit suicide. But of course, that's what's funny is that's never covered in conspiracy theory circles or in media. And I think it's because it's not really a conspiracy theory. It this relates to the Iran Contra affair, which they pretend never happens now, because we already know what the Iran Contra affair is. We already know about. Um, we already know what was going on. We already know that there was a complete and total regime change starting with Ronald Reagan that continued all the way to Barack Obama. And that with and Trump is simply a new phase of that. Um, we, we know that. And we may, we may not all know that we know that, but we do all know that. And they don't want us to catch on to, wait, if you want to know who Barack Obama is, understand that he's the liberal Ronald Reagan. Because, because I think that... I th I think that there's a big effort to distract people with conspiracy theories because if you – like I said, the Iran-Contra affair, the uh, church committee opening of Conchal Pro, I mean they didn't, they didn't want a lot of this stuff released. But the fact that it did get released and the fact that we're seeing patterns and then with the leaks like Edward Snowden, this is I think very damaging to the system. I mean you talk about breaking the system. I think it could break the system over time. I mean it wouldn't happen right away, and I think that worrying about the environment might be a little bit more – of a necessity right now because what we'd only have what nine ten years to be alive because of the uh because of the planet malfunction caused by corporations i mean yeah well um what 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 do you think um we could do concerning um combating 
uh, manufactured conspiracy theories because they're still everywhere. And when you say something against the establishment, you do get labeled a conspiracy theorist. I, th I think it's important to look at it from a from a scientific approach. What would genuinely criticize the system and what sounds like it really wouldn't be criticizing the system? I think I think that's, that's a good way of looking at it. What would point to capitalism being wrong and what would be kind of looks like you'd be distracting away from it kind of thing? I just think that more of a... Um, not necessarily like like a scientific investigation, but like a, a what's the better way of putting it? A political scientific way of looking into it, like rather understanding the contradictions of society rather than looking for some kind of. If, if it sounds like it's too simple to explain everything, it probably is. I, I, I can dig that. So basically, from what I'm hearing you say we need to basically look at the material conditions of what's happening, what's obviously in our face and the contradictions of what they say on television and what they say now on the internet as they've appropriated that too. Like the obvious elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about because I mean, let's face it. The cause is the United States of America and capitalism. There is no Freemason conspiracy. It's America. It's the Pentagon. It's, it's uh, it's the profit motive. That is exactly what's happening here. Yes. Do you plan? Have you ever been to North Korea? I have never been, and I would really like to go, but unfortunately, it is very, very expensive. How much do you need to get there? How much patrons patrons have to pay in so that you do? Like, I think that we should have Jason Unruh in North Korea. I would love to see that. You know, I'd like to see that too. Unfortunately, um, I've incurred a lot of debt from a lot of the computer equipment and camera equipment that I've bought in, over the years, so. I really do have to take care of that first, but I've seen uh, trips f to the DPRK go for upwards of 4,000 euros. Hmm. You know, here, that's that's like a lot of money. That's several thousand dollars. And that's, that's not something I can afford to do. And I don't think that even if I started a GoFundMe, I don't even think that it would it would reach enough money to do that. You're probably correct, but and and I could be totally wrong with my hunch, but I have a hunch that if um, the vanguard that I'm representing here as the public relations cleric, um, and you're networking with uh, MRN. I think that we can get further attention. My only concern is not having our videos flagged by Facebook. The more we say things that people are, you know, certain people won't want to hear. And I'm not sure how to often go beyond the Facebook thing, but I, I think, I think we, in other words, I think we can break through, but I think that I can get you more support to some extent or another than what you already have. And I am kind of dedicated to that in the sense that nobody else is actually looking directly at the problem of the first world versus third world crisis. As I told you in private, I actually just despise Assad. However, I'm really, it's like, I don't like what he does with the Kurdish, although I'm very suspicious of the Kurdish leadership. I find them very suspicious, but I'm for Kurdish autonomy and I'm for their own national cultural autonomy. And I'm against the concept of Kurdistan because it's not going to solve the problem. I think that you need the country of Syria just needs to have autonomy for both, both nations. But what I'm really never will support I don't. I, I didn't support the FSA because I found them to be wrong, and I, 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 I all this. If it funds U.S. imperialism, it's bad. That's how it needs to be. So I, I, I condemn Assad when he's when he's doing bad things to the Kurdish, but I support Assad when U.S. imperialism attacks this country, and therefore I am committed to making sure Assad is not assassinated, to making sure that Syria is not taken over by foreign interests. And I think that we all need to take that stance that there, you know, you know, I mean, there's secondary and primary contradictions that we have to put into account here and people are not putting them into account. And you always put them to into account. And we need to start taking that way more seriously because you could say, like, well, this group here is socialist. OK, how socialist are they if they're aligned with U.S. imperialism? And I've heard you say that a thousand one times. And I still have this argument with peers that I know. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm worried. I'm not too worried, but I'm a little worried because I think that there's a consciousness we have to raise. And I know it's possible because here's the thing. If, if the, uh, if the tea party could grow as big as it could resistance in the first world can grow. And I think it can grow because I think that I think a lot of the real actual, not the Americanists and all their Americanism crap, but the real constitutionalists, for instance, in the United States, I think that they're getting disillusioned with the right wing fringe because the alt right has taken over everything. That's uh, that, that that's of the position they would have held. And I think that the most amusing thing I'm seeing is I'm seeing war veterans talking to me about Mao's and Stalin all of a sudden and Hugo Chavez and Gaddafi. And that was not happening before. And I think it's because if you're really a constitutionalist, you won't be scared of a socialist because the fascist is going to be your primary contradiction at that point. Uh, your, your thoughts on that, as, as, especially in light of not wanting us to like go after North Korea or bomb Iran, which I would say is the real protector of Jewish people in the Middle East, not Israel. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you are, you know, if your main focus is the defense of the Constitution, yeah, fascism would definitely be your enemy in that regard. All right. Well, here's to MRN, uh, you know, expanding. I mean, maybe it will happen, maybe it won't. But I, I think that I think that we can help make sure that it happens or at least try to or at least get you far enough halfway to do it, because I think. I think it'd be cool if you if you did have a show on Press TV, and I think it would be cool if you did uh, have, belong on an eternal uh, alternative channel. But here's the thing: like, we will promote you, but I would never want Jason Unruh to stop being Jason Unruh because even the disagreements are of value to me. Because I, in order for us to develop the theory, it would be necessary, in our opinion, not just mine, but in our opinion, to consistently, to the point of no end, argue with Marxist Leninists. Because for the first time ever, we're taking up MLM templates because our theories like i said our little theories have been proven correct but when we ever flushed out the theories we were borrowing from anarchism that failed we would borrow from trotskyism and that failed you know but we look at the black panthers who were marxist leninists and we see that they were whether they see it or not practicing national cultural autonomy that's why we say we're pantherists because if we say we're marxist leninists or marxist leninist maoist then you know any jewish anarchists that want to join you know don't join and we have a good history with the anarchists. I mean, I, I would say we have probably a better history with the anarchists than Marxist Leninists do. But what works is pantherism. I think in the first world, pantherism actually works, and we're promoting pantherism. And, and, and we've mentioned modern Bundism definitely would fall under pantherism. However, for pantherism to work, I think we need a third world as voice talking. And I think that you can spearhead that voice. And we. Four of the videos we've done, and I, I probably won't be doing this much anymore, but I did do it as a deliberate endorsement. Four of the videos we did, which I spoke on, and this, these were all in the office, uh, not not at my house like I am right now. Um, but in the office, I did this. The four recent videos end with presentations from you. And that was a deliberate endorsement. In fact, if you look at the description, you can see uh, an endorsement to your website and to your Patreon page. And I did this deliberately because I'm saying, yes, we agree with the third worldists. I, we may differ on some things and, and we do differ because we also take the fourth world into account. And we also have a different view of what the first of what the second world is today, because we would say the first the second world is uh, declining countries now, not uh, not rising countries, because we think that it changed after the Cold War. However, these are largely nuances. Pretty much everything you say about the first world conditions and first world privilege and the brainwashing that that entails. Because if we are victims in the first world, we're victims of brainwashing. Uh, you were, for the longest time, were the only one that talked about any of that. And it's now catching on, but you were the one that started that. And you're the one who actually has the solid theory about third worldism. And I don't see a solid theory about third worldism coming from anybody else. Hmm. Well, thank you. Well, you have uh, you have been very gracious by talking to me. Thank you. I, I hope that um, I hope my my, my ranting and I, I didn't speak over to you too much. I, I make that mistake. I hope I didn't talk over you too much, and I hope I gave you the opportunity to speak. And thank you for educating me about North Korea. The DPRK had become primary interest when I realized I wasn't finding any actual solid information, and I really appreciate what you've told me. 
Okay, well, yeah, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Long live the revolution. <laughs>